Best known as the Rev while drumming for Avenged Sevenfold, Jimmy Sullivan was just 28 years old when he died in 2009. Prior to his death, the band were recording their fifth album, and after a brief lapse of inactivity, Jimmy's drum parts were eventually completed by one of his musical heroes. Jimmy would win multiple accolades, both during his life and posthumously. Today, let's explore the life and death of Avenged Sevenfold drummer Jimmy the Rev Sullivan. Jimmy Sullivan was born on February 9th, 1981 in Tustin, California. His family would soon relocate to Huntington Beach, where Jimmy, like a lot of kids, spent time on the beach, watched WWF, played basketball, and of course took up an interest in music. Jimmy became interested in drums at the age of five, and some of his early influences included Pantera, Slayer, Frank Zappa, and King Crimson. He would have the support of his parents early on in his life, with his parents driving him as far as an hour to his lessons with Jeanette Raitt, with his mother telling louder sound, she was from Hermosa Beach, which is quite a trek from here, but she was that good. You can see the results. He was a phenomenal drummer. We stayed up with her until the point where she looked at him and said, I have nothing more to teach you. His proficiency had grown considerably by the age of 11, and as part of her college ensemble, he'd be able to drum through the entirety of Frank Zappa's piece, The Black Page, which is notorious for its difficulty. In fact, Jimmy would become a proficient piano player and bring in a lot of song ideas and arrangements to Avenge Sevenfold, sometimes with vocals as well. It was during his early teenage years in school where he would meet his future bandmates, including Sinister Gates and M. Shadows, and M. Shadows would tell Metal Hammer, first time I met Jimmy, I was at basketball camp during the summer. I knew Jimmy was trouble because he had a reputation that he was a bit of an out-of-control kid. We hooked up and he was like, hey, I'm riding my bike out. You want to jump on the handlebars? So I jumped on and the whole way home, I knocked over every trash can. I thought, I love this guy. And I found out he lived five houses away from me. So I got on my bike and that was it. We were best buds, he'd recall. He would meet his future bandmate Sinister Gates under different circumstances, getting into a scuffle with them during a woodworking class in the 8th grade. But before they knew it, the pair would share a mutual love of the same type of music. Soon enough, the pair would go back to Gates' house, whose brother was also a drummer, and Jimmy showed off his drumming chops with Gates remembering to Metal Hammer. I was effing blown away. I had never heard drumming that great on tape or CD at that point. This guy was next level. I come to find out he's playing Dream Theater stuff and shit that I'd never heard before. Things that truly blew my mind. We just hit it off right there, he'd recall. While they formed a friendship with Jimmy, they wouldn't form a band until after high school. M. Shadows would recall to Metal Hammer, When we were starting out our band, we really wanted him to play, but he was playing with guys in high school and older, ages 14 and up, and we were in the 7th and 8th grade, ages 12 to 14. He had no time for us because he was so far advanced musically. He was playing Pantera and Slayer note for note. We didn't even know how to get the source note on the guitar. But once we got serious and we were trying to do our own thing, he was like, okay, let's play together and see what happens. In high school, Jimmy would start playing in bands, joining the ska group Bomb Squad when he was just 17 in 1998, and they would put out a self-titled album the following year in 1999. Later that year, the band would experience a lineup change as well as a change in their name becoming Suburban Legends. And following the release of Suburban Legends' debut album, Origin Edition, Jimmy would leave the band and form his own group with M. Shadows on lead vocals and Matt Went on bass. The three would round out their lineup Zachary Vengeance on guitar for the time being. By this point, Venge Sevenfold would develop a distinctive metalcore sound that defined much of their early material. Even with this musical direction, the band always had a broad musical palette, with M. Shadows telling the online webzine into obscurity. We play whatever we want because there are too many bands trying to make it big. We just want to play what makes us happy and we write however and whatever we want regardless of what others are doing. I'll be the first to admit, you'll find me listening to Skid Row or Guns N' Roses albums before any hardcore band. It's not only the type of music I like, but we all love that stuff, you'd say. Avenge Sevenfold's first recording would be a self-released demo CD in 1999 that contained three tracks including Forgotten Faces, Thick and Thin, and The Art of Subconscious Illusions. Although the recording was rudimentary, it generated some interest from indie label Sadistic Records, who requested that the band record new tracks for two upcoming compilations. Soon enough, Avenged Sevenfold found their way onto another indie label, Good Life Recordings, and began recording their debut record, Sounding the Seventh Trumpet. By this point, Justin Sane, who had previously played bass for Suburban Legends, would replace Matt Went. It was also during this time that the band would be inspired by Guns N' Roses guitar Slash, and begin adopting their signature aliases. Went for his part, would still stay friends with the band, but instead go to college and have a family and get involved in politics. For the group's debut album, Jimmy did all his drum parts in one take, and based on what he laid down, the band members would add their parts on top of it. 
The result from this lineup was sounding the seventh trumpet, which was recorded for only $2,000 and included newly re-recorded versions of their demos. After several delays, the album would finally be released on July 24th, 2001. It was also during this time the band added new guitar Sinister Gates to the group. In both the band name and the album, Avenged Sevenfold would use religion as a thematic influence. M. Shadows would derive the band's name from a passage in the Bible story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis, which reads, and I quote, But the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken upon him sevenfold. By the same token, the album's title refers to chapter 11 in the book of Revelations, in which the sounding of the seventh and final trumpet signified God's wrath. But even though the album and the band's name made references to God and the devil, M Shadows will clarify that Avenged Sevenfold is not a religious band telling the music site launch. Anyone that reads the lyrics and knows anything about us, they would know that we're not promoting either. That's one thing about this band I love. We never really shove any kind of political or religious beliefs on people. The music's there to entertain and it may be thought provoking on both sides, he'd say. It was during the same year that Jimmy, under the alias Radhead, fronted an experimental side project called Pinkly Smooth, incorporating fellow bandmates Sinister Gates and Just the Saint. They released one album independently, which combined elements of punk, ska, and progressive metal, and was generally well received. By August of 2001, though, Justin Sane would grow disenchanted with the band, going so far as to attempt to end his life by ingesting cough syrup in abnormal amounts. Although he survived, the extent of his condition left him no longer to be able to play in the band. M. Shadows would later speak of this incident, telling VH1, he permafried his brain and was in a mental institution for a long time. When you have someone in your band who does that, it ruins everything that's going on all around you, and it makes you want to do something to prevent it from happening to other people. It was the following year that Avenged Sevenfold would leave Good Life Recordings for Hopeless Records, and their debut album was re-released by the label. Based on the reception from these releases, the band started gaining recognition on a much wider scale, with temporary fill-in bassist Frank Malcolm, who adopted the moniker Damian Marsh. Avenged Sevenfold would spend the year touring the album with bigger bands, namely Mushroomhead and Shadows Fall. Eventually, they would find a long-term replacement with bassist Johnny Christ, and this would solidify the band's classic lineup for the next several years. With their new bassist, Avenged Sevenfold turned their sights to recording their sophomore album, Waking the Fallen, which saw considerable improvement in the band's approach. Along with Avenged Sevenfold's expansion towards other genres, including power metal and death metal, M. Shadow showcased greater variation in his vocal range as well, and both Zacky Vengeance and Sinister Gates have a bigger presence on the album too. Upon the album's release in 2003, it received much critical acclaim, no pun intended, with Billboard magazine profiling the band several times, and the album would take the number 6 spot on Metal Hammer's 100 Greatest Albums of the 21st Century list. Videos would be made for the single Second Heartbeat and Unholy Confessions, each set the live performances of the songs, the first taking place at the Warp Tour in 2003, and the later at the Henry Fonda Theatre. Another notable point in the band's transition was the album's third track, Chapter 4, being featured in the video games Madden 2004 and NHL 2004, which led the band to securing a major recording deal with Warner Brothers. As the band's profile grew, though, so did their partying. During a 2004 tour to support the album, Zaki Vengeance would tell Metal Hammer, the first time we ever played abroad was in the UK, opening for Lost Profits in the Bronx. Dude, we were in six passenger van and we were out of our minds. We were drinking as much as we possibly could. We play as hard as we could. And then we go walk over to the bar, have fans buy us shots. And by the end of the night, we were pretty belligerent. We'd get up hungover, get in the van and then pull over, and let Johnny puke up on the side of the road. That was our real first taste going out on tour. And we took every advantage of it we could, he'd say. It was during the same time that Jimmy found himself arrested in London after the members got involved in a drunken brawl at a local bar, only for the police to show up and for Jimmy to make fun of them for not carrying guns. They would respond by macing him and throwing him in prison, and M. Shadows would recall to Metal Hammer, we had to play Rock and Ring in Germany or something the next day, but Jimmy didn't take a shower. He had mace all over him when he played the show the next day. It was a complete debacle, he'd remember. It would be amazing that the band would survive that tour with Sinister Gates recalling the Metal Hammer. Really, any night could just escalate, not just because of us, but because of being in a foreign place, being out too late. There were people around you who just wouldn't stop buying you shots. One time I had 10 shots of Aftershock in my hand, and next to me was my snake bite in black. I should have died of alcohol poisoning. By the end of the first UK tour, we were 10 pounds heavier and, and pretty hefty, he'd say. The band would return in 2005 with their third album and major label debut, City of Evil which featured the hits Bad Country and The Beast and the Harlot. The album sound would drift away from their first two albums, trying to be more metal sounding and featuring less screaming vocals. Jimmy would comment on this change in the band's approach, telling Modern Drummer, 
I remember the day we decided to stop screaming. It was our last show before we went home to write City of Evil. Matt was just really sick of screaming. He'd had surgery a year before. They took out a blood vessel in his vocal cords that would flame up and close up in his throat. He could still scream today if he wanted to, but he got sick of it. We wrote everything keeping in mind that we weren't going to scream anymore, and all of a sudden it was much more fun he'd say. Jimmy would also comment on his growth as a drummer since making the album, recalling, On Waking the Fallen, we wanted to simplify everything a lot. We did, but at times I wasn't very happy with that as a drummer. It was good for the record, but I held back a lot. On this one, I didn't want to hold back at all in places that I thought called for crazy fills. I decided I was going to have every part written out, every fill, everything, and try to make it as creative as possible and not just as fast as possible. I'm really happy with the way it turned out, and I want to outdo it on the next record by 100%, he'd say. City of Evil would prove to be a huge success for the band going platinum in America, and as a result of their success, they took their partying to new inebriated heights. Sinister Gates would recall to Metal Hammer, we were constantly reining each other in, but there was nobody to lead by example. It was during this time the band would send Jimmy to rehab to deal with an escalating cocaine addiction, and while it would help him kick his habit, Gates would admit that the day he got Jimmy out of rehab, they had one last hurrah before quitting the drug for good. By the time the band began recording their fourth album, it seemed like most of the group had cleaned up their act, with the exception of Jimmy. As Sinister Gates would recall to Metal Hammer, we saw him gaining a lot of weight. We were a little uneducated on the exact drugs that he was taking. Nobody in the band was ever into that, so he was living in a different world. We still saw each other all the time, but we were concerned, you know. Johnny would add in the same interview, he was acting differently. He wasn't just fun-loving Jimmy. We knew there was something different, but I'd be lying if I said, oh yeah, he was doing this or that. We didn't know all of it, he'd say. Despite his personal problems, a drummer would utilize his talents as both a singer and a songwriter, contributing to half of the songs on the group's fourth album, including Almost Easy, Scream, and Afterlife, all of which became hits. Reviews of the album would be mixed, but it would chart highly both locally and internationally, going platinum once again. A compilation album titled Live in the LDC and Diamonds in the Rough, which featured a concert DVD and various B-side singles, would be released in 2008, and the band's momentum persisted into the recording of their fifth album, Nightmare. But that momentum would soon come to a halt. Much like the group's self-titled album, Jimmy had a lot of musical contributions on what would be his final record with the band. While the time leading up to the recording of Nightmare saw the drummer in and out of rehab, as well as be confronted by his bandmates about his personal problems, he was on a creative streak during the recording of the record. It was during the early sessions of Nightmare that Jimmy would bring in a song that was called Death that would be his final track with the band. The song would later be renamed Fiction, a name the drummer had given himself. The song's lyrics would foreshadow the drummer's demise, and the demo that Jimmy brought in consisted of drums, piano, and some vocals. And M Shadows would reflect back on the song, recalling, I don't know of any time in history where someone had basically said goodbye on a track and then pass away, and then their music comes out six or seven months later with them singing on it. It's pretty crazy, it's pretty surreal, he'd recall. About a month into the recording of Nightmare, the members would attend the wedding of a mutual friend on December 27, 2009. Jimmy that night, according to Metal Hammer, had just underwent laser eye surgery, and joked how he was finally able to, and I quote, see them. The next morning, the drummer was found unresponsive by his girlfriend at his home in Huntington Beach. He would pass away at the young age of 28. Following the tragic news, his friends, family, and bandmates would spend the evening at Jimmy's place remembering their friend. The coroner's report would state that Jimmy's death was due to a deadly combination of prescription medication and alcohol, and a private ceremony would be held on January 6, 2010, with the eulogy being delivered by Sinister Gates. The band had thought about disbanding following his death, but they decided to continue on, thinking that's what Jimmy would have wanted. The track Fiction on the album would keep Jimmy's vocals and CM Shadows duet with him, and the remainder of the drum tracks on Nightmare would be recorded by one of Jimmy's drumming heroes, Mike Portnoy, of Dream Theater fame. Nightmare would be released in June of 2010 and debut at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. The album would be dedicated to Jimmy, and its artwork would feature a tribute to the drummer with a tombstone that would say forever, with the letters Rev being highlighted. The band would also record the track So Far Away as a tribute to their departed friend. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. We'll see you again in Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.